The train came out of the long tunnel into the snow country. The earth lay white under the night sky. The train pulled up at a signal stop. The white of the snow fell away into the darkness some distance before it reached them. Good morning! Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Emma and I like to talk a lot about books. So today is actually going to be one of, if not, I think the first formal book review, like single book review I've ever done on my channel. And I am just beyond the moon excited about it. I've been wanting to do kind of single book review videos for a long time, but I've just never sat down to do a proper one because it took a little bit more work. Wasn't sure if people were interested, but today um, I just have a book that I just can't not talk about, um, and that is Snow Country by Yasunari Kawabata. One of the ideas I had for this kind of book series was to do one review and to pick one book, kind of my favorite book of the month. So in January, Snow Country was a book that has really stayed with me and I've just thought about and thought about and thought about. So I thought that this was the first book I would choose to do and start and commence this book review series uh, with. So if you are interested in learning about Snow Country and hearing about it and hearing my thoughts, this is going to be a spoiler-free review. I'm going to go into it. I'm going to talk a little bit about Kawabata. I'm going to talk about um, some of the context, some of the history, some of the imagery, symbolism, just everything because this book is rife and ripe with beauty and wasted beauty and decay and snow and desolation. So let's just get right into it. To start with a little bit of background information on Kawabata, he is a Japanese author and he was born in 1899 in Osaka, Japan. He was orphaned at the age of two and he actually began to write a lot of stories and fiction and compose things when he was still in high school. Eventually when he got to university, some of his stories were published and the work we're going to be talking about today, Snow Country, was started in 1934 and finally the last piece of it was completed in 1947. In 1968, Kawabata became the first Japanese writer ever to be awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, which is really exciting, and this book just left such an impact on me, um, and I've just been thinking about it so much, and it's just such a tragic story. If you are interested in this, um, be aware that it's just not a fun time. This book is full of people who do horrible things, full of really tragic uh, human circumstances and emotion and just everything. So let's begin. So what is this book about? A brief synopsis. We're following two people principally. We have Shimamura who is a pretty well-off wealthy intellectual from Tokyo and he's coming to stay at this isolated mountain hot spring way off in the mountains on the western side of Japan. We also have Komako who lives at this isolated hot mountain spring and she has recently become a geisha. So we follow these two people as they form a relationship, although it is definitely a relationship without any of the qualifications factors that make a relationship and certainly a healthy happy one. They basically exist and coexist in misery the whole time that Shimamura is staying at this hot mountain spring. He is coming to visit for the second time and when he arrives he finds that Komako is much changed. There are circumstances going on in her life that's affecting her and her work and her ability to um, maintain an income and live her life. Komako very much wants to be attached and form a relationship to Shimamura even though she knows it is doomed and that it can't last, but she does so anyway, and we follow the disastrous consequences. I think one of the most telling things about this book, and a straightaway hint that this book is not going to be about the connection via humans that you would normally expect from a typical love story, but it's very much going to be about the lack of connection between people, because one of the first images we get of a human in this book is a station master of the train as Shimamura is pulling in to the mountain hot spring, and it says, The station master walked slowly over the snow, a lantern in his hand. His face was buried to the nose in a muffler, and the flaps of his cap were turned down over his ears. It's just so brilliant because this whole book is about burying your human emotions and your connection and denying your love and essentially cocooning yourself and swaddling yourself in clothes or burying yourself under snow or wrapping yourself up to get away from what you fear. And in that case, uh, Shimamura, one of our protagonists, deeply fears 
connection and human emotion and love. And so this book is all about denial and turning away from that extension of yourself to meet and connect with someone else. So kind of using that image of a man just muffled and bundled up as a starting point and jumping into the reasons why he's bundled up, why this book is called Snow Country. The introduction of this book just brilliantly tells you that the snow country, the term snow country doesn't just mean a country where snow falls. It indicates very specifically a region in Japan and says that the west coast of the main island of Japan is probably for its latitude, the snowiest region in the world. And from December to April or May, only the railroads are open and the snow in the mountains is sometimes as much as 15 feet deep. It suggests long gray winters, tunnels under the snow, dark houses with rafters black from the smoke of winter fires, or to the more imaginative, life divorced from time through the long snowbound months. And in this kind of divorcing of the concept of time because of the snow that just buries everything and very much hides the fact that time is passing, that the seasons are changing because from December to April or May, things stay completely the same in the snow country. It is a novel about waste, about wasted time, about wasted emotions and energy and love. It's also a book about so much decay and destitution because in the mountains, in the hot mountain spring, time is passing, seasons are changing, but our heroes are unable to distinguish any change and to bring about any change in themselves. And so they stay with this really stagnant, stale, smothered existence that they can't escape from. But really what is kind of the cause of this waste that is being created? Yeah, so the cause of this waste um, is the snow that essentially we create in ourselves, is the neglect that Shimamura has been probably brought up with and is now so incredibly equipped to kind of deal out to other people in his life. The snow is created every day when these people and when ourselves turn away from our emotions and our human nature when we sever connections instead of creating them when people in this book don't say what they mean, when people in this book are so miserable but can't ever admit why or how they're miserable and so become more miserable. So the snow is just such a perfect image for so many reasons. One of those reasons is the contrast that it provides and so I'm gonna go in and talk a little bit about kind of the color and the colors of this novel and why the snow acts as such a blanket and such a visual tool to help the performances in this book. So the introduction also tells us that Kawabata has been put in a literary line that can be traced back to 17th century haiku masters. If you are unfamiliar with the form of the haiku, they are 17 syllable poems that seek to convey a sudden awareness of beauty by a mating of opposite or incongruous terms. And so this is where the snow really comes in specifically in the play of different colors. One of the most striking and extremely repetitive images and pairings in this book is the color white with the color red. As you can imagine, it is almost always 100% of the time the snow that is providing that white blanketed, blinding color. And it's also super cool because the other half of the time, the color red is provided by humans and more often than not, Komeko herself. So this white kind of blanketed nothingness is pretty much the landscape of Shimamura's life and the play of his emotions because he is so adept at just turning into himself and muting and muffling everything like snow does, that kind of soundscape that snow creates. But Komako is there to definitely draw him out and try and bring him out and Kaobata is just so wonderfully good at creating these little tiny scenes and bursts of color. So for example, describing Komako's face, the high thin nose was a little lonely, a little sad, but the bud of her lips opened and closed smoothly like a beautiful little circle of leeches so not only that one do you get like that color but you also get this grotesque imagery and imagery provided by Shimamura in this context because he's so afraid of that connection of that intimacy of being personal and being connected and getting into a relationship with someone that he sees Komako's lips as leeches as these parasitic animals that will suck your blood and do you harm so it's just such like such a good image oh my gosh or a different time when they've spent the night together and the sun is rising presently the room was so light that he could see the red of her cheeks his eye was fastened on that extraordinarily bright red your cheeks are flaming that's how cold it is. So as much as Shimamura is this image of ice, um, Komako is always kind of this fire. And as much as Komako tries to kind of break through this barrier of ice, 
Shimamura does notice and he does see these flashes of red and these kind of swellings of human emotion and potentially love and connection, but it's just always barricaded with a blockade of more ice and more snow and more frost and coldness. And so it's a waste of energy on Komeko's part and a complete just shut off and turn off of all human emotion on Shimamura's part. Shimamura glanced up at her and immediately lowered his head. The white in the depths of the mirror was the snow, and floating in the middle of it were the woman's bright red cheeks. There was an indescribably fresh beauty in the contrast. Was the sun already up? The brightness of the snow was more intense. It seemed to be burning icily. The color of evening had already fallen on the mountain valley, early buried in shadows. Out of the dusk, the distant mountains, still reflecting the light of the evening sun, seemed to have come much nearer. Presently, as the mountain chasms were far and near, high and low, the shadows in them began to deepen, and the sky was red over the snowy mountains. Like a warm light, Komeko poured in on the empty wretchedness that had assailed Shimamura. So whether it be this image of red berries, kind of as Shimamura is looking out the window at the mountains, or the sunrise and the red creeping sun coming up behind the mountains, or even a red ribbon in Komeko's hair contrasted against the snow outside, you always have these like bursts and opportunities for Shimamura to let go of the snow and to let like the red shine shine forth more, but always the red is a very small pinprick, essentially of blood against this huge, vast, limitless distance of snow and it's just so heartbreaking. I think another cool thing is that is also the image and the design of Japan's flag. So as you can imagine, there is a little bit of commentary going on there as well. To discuss Shimamura a little bit more in depth, I think some pieces of information and images that really help us kind of get to know him and why he's like this is his job and kind of him being a connoisseur of art. He's very interested in Western ballet and he writes extensively upon the ballet. He writes about different performances, and different choreography and costumes and everything that goes into the art of ballet, but he's never actually seen a ballet in real life. He's never seen it performed, he's never seen it anywhere in his life, he's only ever read about it from books. He's never actually seen a ballet. And this distance that he maintains in his work and in his exploration of art and essentially in his job, what he does is very much the same distance that he maintains in life to people and to relationships and especially to Komako. He never wants to let her in. He's always very much closed off at a distance. He uses her, he abuses her because he's so scared of real um, deep human connection and the fear and the pain that that could cause if something were to go wrong. So he very much maintains that distance that he does from ballet, where all context that he gets from it is just red. And so he's provided with this language to describe and to talk about ballet, but I'm not really sure if he can ever truly know or speak that language correctly because he's never actually seen ballet. And it's very much the same with kind of the language of love in this book as well. He is a symbol of kind of the vacant house, this empty parking lot, the snow that blankets and muffles and mutes and smothers and suffocates everything. And it is just so awful and hard to see as a reader as well. There's also this really scary passage in the book where Shimamura is staying in his room in the hot mountain spring in the resorts and it's kind of moth season and so he sees a moth hanging on the curtain of his room at the window and first of all the image of the moth is just such another wonderful symbol because moths are extremely drawn to light um, but they require so much darkness in order to be drawn to that light. They also are creatures of the night, they also swaddle themselves and cocoon themselves um, in, and it's just very much Shimamura. And so when he's confronted with this image of the moth on page 90, I believe, it says that its feelers stood out like delicate wool, the color of cedar bark, and its wings, the length of a woman's finger, were a pale, almost diaphanous green. The ranges of mountains beyond were already autumn red in the evening sun. That one spot of pale green struck him as oddly like the color of death. The fore and after wings overlapped to make a deeper green, and the wings fluttered like thin pieces of paper in the autumn wind. The moth did not move. He struck at it with his fist, and it fell like a leaf from a tree floating lightly up midway to the ground. So at this hot mountain spring, he's just provided with so many opportunities to change and to be a better person and to learn more about himself. Um, 
and to treat others <laughs> nicely um, and to kind of deepen his understanding of what it means to be a human in relation to other humans but even when he is confronted with an image that so much describes who he is himself he's unable to cope with it unable to understand it and his first instinct is to crush it and kill it komako on the other hand to talk about her for a little bit is the symbol of wasted love and decaying beauty an energy that is expended over and over and over again but is always futile and fruitless and wasted the introduction is again very good at providing us with needed uh, information about specifically the hot spring uh, geisha. It says the special delights of the hot spring are for the unaccompanied gentleman. No prosperous hot spring is without its geisha and its compliant hotel maids. If the hot spring geisha is not a social outcast, she is perilously near being one. The city geisha may become a celebrated musician or dancer, a political intriguer, even a dispenser of patronage. The hot spring geisha must go on entertaining weekend guests, and the pretense that she is an artist and not a prostitute is often a thin one indeed. So for Komako, who is stuck here at this hot mountain spring, who has limited opportunities, who can't do very much, who is just trying to get by and survive, uh, she sees Shimamura as a way out and expends so much energy um, on trying to love him and give herself to him and form like a real concrete relationship, but the whole time she's just being misled and used and abused. Um, and that's just so heartbreaking to see as well. Um, as the seasons change in the mountain as well, we see Komako growing more frustrated and restless and unable to cope with her situation because she really has no opportunities to go anywhere. And she says that she'll more likely than not follow the pattern and the lives of the other hot spring geisha in the mountains, which is just to stay there until she dies. Um, a really good kind of image and just to have a little talk about her is this um, traditional piece of folk art that she creates and that other women create. There's so much energy and love and time that goes into creating this beautifully intricate and complicated and so woven piece of cloth. It's called Chijimi cloth and there's a scene where Shimamura goes into town and him being very wealthy and well off, he simply picks it up and buys it um, just to have as kind of this plaything and as this toy and as this symbol of wealth. And he's just able to buy it carelessly and throw money away on it. But for the reader and for Shimamura as well, he knows so much time has gone into creating this piece of cloth and so much sacrifice and thought and emotion, but he's just able to pick it up and throw it away at will, which is basically him and Komako and their relationship. Snow Country has some of the most subtle and kind of economical writing I've ever witnessed. There is always so much just implied, which very much kind of fits into the form and figure and purpose of the haiku. Um, it's a very intimate kind of implication. Nothing's ever explicitly said, um, especially the communication and more often than not, miscommunication between Komako and Shimamura. There's also another woman at this hot mountain spring, Yoko, um, and she provides kind of this contrast and relief against Komako. And there's very much a rivalry between these two girls and Shimamura gets involved as well. And this book is just one big spiraling mess. Um, I would suggest reading it for the beauty of the imagery, the genius that Kaobata is so good at infusing in here with these little tiny implications um, and these little minuscule pricks of light and color and consequence. Reading it for the lack of human emotion that is just always so present and ready to accept and fill itself up with human emotion and connection but never ever does. Very much read it for the kind of denial of love and the heartbreak and the long winter nights and the tragedy. You could also see like the snow country and this hot mountain spring as very much this fantasy world because the novel opens with Shimamura on a train going under this tunnel and he starts to have these kind of fantastical visions and sees these fantasy images and strange things. It's very much a world with separate rules, separate patterns, separate happenings from our own and especially because he's from Tokyo it is so different. In fact the whole image and the whole phenomenon of a hot mountain spring being something warm and bubbling and bright um, and offering so much contrast against the landscape where it is um, finding its origin on this mountain and very cold and dreary. Uh, it feels like something that shouldn't be and that's kind of their whole relationship as well where Komanko is very much the hot mountain spring and Shimamura is um, 
the snowy mountains kind of melting outwards and melting away and always trying to get away from the heat of that hot mountain spring. The image of the snow also has like a very powerful kind of um, prophecy because snowflakes are very much symmetrical. They're all perfectly symmetrical. They um, inform us of hidden patterns and this book is also very much kind of doomed to these outcomes and the snow and kind of the falling snowflakes is very much kind of an informer of what is going to happen and forecasting um, what the relationship is going to go through, what it's going to look like, how it's going to end up. So yeah, overall I think this book was phenomenal. This was my first Kaobata I've ever read. I'm very much looking forward to reading more. Um, if you guys have any thoughts on it, please let me know. If you'd like to see more of these kind of mini reviews, also let me know because I'm trying to decide if there's a book I want to pick from the ones I read in February to do or if not, but I was just so absolutely impressed with this book um, and it was just so good. So subtle, so devastating, so blunt and brisk and I loved it. So that is my review of Snow Country. Um, I would highly recommend it, clearly. Yeah, so thank you so much for watching and I'll see you very soon in my next video. I hope you're doing well. Ciao! Komako slid the door half shut behind him. She glanced up at the sky. It's beginning to look like snow, the end of the maple leaves. She recited a line of poetry as she stepped outside. Here in our mountains, the snow falls even on the maple leaves.